When you mention the words regenerative agriculture and polite company these days, you get a variety of responses. Uh, in fact, the in fact, the, res the, the debate has become entirely polarised and occasionally violent. Um, so into that context, may I introduce our next speaker, Jacqueline Roweth. Uh, Jacqueline, when I asked her to provide a few words that I could use to introduce her with, um, she describes... She's an ex-president of the New Zealand Grasslands Association uh, and a deputy chair currently of the New Zealand Grasslands Trust, and she is enjoying retirement. I actually find that really hard to believe. No, I have. Uh, and she claims that old scientists, old soil scientists, I should say, old soil scientists never die. They just lose their profile. Thank you very much, wild man of ag research. I have several authors on this. Mike and uh, Ant send their apologies, and that one is probably apologising for his hair, but moving on. Some of us have been on this journey for some time. And in fact, it's now three years since I wrote the first article, which the editor then saved for the first issue of Rural News, it's proposing a better way than what Warren just mentioned in terms of our science priority. Because honestly, Sue, not listening anymore, if I had chosen a science priority for New Zealand, that RA thing would not have been it. Why? Well, my first is, um, statement as the daughter of an English teacher mother and a British Royal Naval father is that you can't regenerate something unless you've degenerated it. And we have 150 years of research that says we have beautiful soils. We've been looking after them. There are some hot spots, not usually, not the biggest areas connected with agriculture actually, but we're doing better all the time. So just in definition, this bothers me. And we know that we have a whole lot of people out there in wider New Zealand who think that we've stuffed our soils and, in fact, we've made them better. We have research on them, better in terms of organic matter and management. And when I see statements like this from the white paper that was created in 2021, I am sad. Because my favourite topic is actually the resourceful, productive and innovative New Zealand farmer that works closely with the rural professionals and scientists of New Zealand to create the most resilient system that there is on this planet. We have the data. Land use change has always been part of it. We've covered that in our reflection from Jeff Grant, who commented about subsidies moving, <laughs> being taken away, and the New Zealand farmers adapted with the support of science and rural professionals. Land use change is part of what we do. And in terms of productive, we have the data. Since the global financial crisis, for instance, and I have to use that because it's the only data I can get out of the OECD, we're at 2.2% productivity growth, beaten occasionally by retail. But what money do they think they're spending? Only that which we brought into the country through our exports. We're a bio-circular economy, and we should never forget that. And OECD, 1%, my home country, 0% in terms of productivity growth. So congratulations to everybody here. You are the point where the ripples spread out in spreading the research that leads to the resilience adopted by the farmer. And when I see this, I just weep. Many of you will have seen the ODT thing. Apparently, it's being redone in countrywide for the next month. And we know what happened here. We know because we've been doing the science, the research for a long time. So I'm sad about these people. I think they were very brave. It took quite a long time for anybody who got involved in Probitas to actually say we spent a quarter of a million dollars and there's nothing we've seen for it. But now we've already seen this couple, Lincoln people, uh, who've had a brush with regenerative and now they're in the red. So let's look, mostly you have to, unless you go to sleep, because I've put it up on the slide now, that the goals for regenerative agriculture, the results from research, and here is where the research was done. So the goals, building soil health. You know, I understand about human health. I can take a temperature and all of that sort of thing. I like the term soil quality, because that's actually more measurable. And we have some good parameters. And that, of course, was the work with Lucy, the um, 
done in about 2007 involving all the CRI's universities and some of the big agri groups, like indeed Ravensdown and Balance. And the soil health component usually comes down to soil organic matter, which is soil carbon. And we know from the work that Louis Shipper did, published 2017, that we have increased our soil carbon since coming out of forestry. And the increase has been to superphosphate and then nitrogen in some areas. We've got the examples from Parsons published in various things, including NZGA. And most recently, Stu Leggard with his life cycle analysis um, has pointed out that if we go from pasture to forestry, we will lose soil carbon. But the overall thing for me is that proponents coming from the USA, where they have half the, uh, the soil carbon that we have, or Australia, where they have a third, are not able to contextualise what we have done to create our good soils because their experience is completely different. So at this point, I alert you to the fact that we have a whole new group of people out there doing advice, which, and they are termed coaches, and there is no discipline that supports them. Engineers, medical practitioners, they have a legal framework under which they operate. Agriculture, agronomy, soil science has some boundaries, and we have industry discipline bodies. Coaches, nothing. This next one, increasing plant and animal nutritive quality, there is absolutely no evidence that your production system makes any difference to what comes out from the farm gate. There are differences according to cultivar, season, soil type, but under the same, manage, uh, same soil area in the same season, there is no difference that organics or, well, let's just stick with organics, um, or conventional will make any difference. We have the data. And if people are worried about nutritive quality, I suggest they stop going to the fast food outlets and indeed look at where they're shopping in the supermarket. The very fact that we have all those, there are more and more shelves of the healthy muesli bars, just check what's actually in them. And the fizzy drink aisles are exploding. That's where we lose nutritive quality. Go back, there is no evidence at the farm gate or indeed the orchard gate, that there is any difference from now and uh, 50 years ago, except with a slightly more carbon dioxide in the air, some of our plants have not kept up, so there's more dry matter in them. And we published this in Grassland Association, Fertiliser and Lime, now called Farm Landscape, sorry, messy people. Farm Landscape Research Centre Proceedings, the data are available. Reducing stresses on stock animals, okay. New Zealand has the best record possible and there is no country with a higher record of, according to the Animal Protection Index, the World Animal Protection Organization, checking up all the countries, nobody does better than we do in farm animals. I think that's tremendous. And in terms of our trading partners, oh dear, they're lower and I'm not even going to comment about China. But there we are, we have the data. So do not listen to the coaches saying, we can do even better. We do even better all the time. And then the reducing dependence on agricultural chemicals, remembering I'm going through the goals. It's like we're some sort of junkies. Actually, our end balance is considerably less than most other places, including the Netherlands, which is now reducing its herd sizes, for instance, in order to reduce its nitrogen balance, and that will have an effect on their greenhouse gases as well. But when we say reduce dependence, so don't put it on, we have the poor Southland couple example of what happens if you take away all the fertiliser. They crash. The Keynes actually made the comment that they hadn't done capital top dressing. They were green already. They hadn't done capital top dressing before they started the move to regenerative. We have evidence from the fertiliser companies that some other people who have made the switch actually did double capital top, dress, top dressing and then moved into regenerative and then they start to run out. The banks would say, Meh. people, their customers who come and say they want to be organic, it'll be seven to ten years before they sell the farm and that's the amount of time it takes to reduce their nutrient status to bordering uneconomic or uneconomic, sorry all those of you who would like to be organic, we all would. Meh. But does it result in anything that's actually better? No. Not, um, not by quality and certainly not by quantity. 
And the thing is, we've done the research. Back in 1984, when the subsidies were being removed, we did the long-term superphosphate trials and withheld superphosphate. In 1990, Greg Lambert did the economic calculations and said you can probably get away with it for a year without putting on any phosphate, but don't consider it for longer. There will be economic implications and you will have to do the catch-up. 1999, Mike Dodd's paper saying, hmm, even after all this time, the production productivity is still decreasing. It takes a while to re-stabilise. So my question is, what are we trying to achieve? And if we're talking about science priorities, as mentioned by Sue Bridrose, why are we not concentrating on explaining to society where we are, what we're doing, and how we get even better all the time? New Zealand farmers don't do status quo. We're the most changeable, <laughs> changeable, adaptive, innovative group in the whole wide world. Are we trying to protect the environment? Check the data from Europe, America, wherever else. We're doing very well and we do better all the time. Resilience, well, we've got a bit of a hurdle with Hewaka Ekanoa and the water coming up, but we will get through this. And part of that is because the government is realizing it's too much all at once taking things step by step. The whole point of Hewaka Ekanoa is that we do get, if it goes through, to negotiate in 2024. We remain at the table and are able to make the case for what the New Zealand farmer is already doing. And in terms of well-being, well, we saw from the Keynes, we've got the research from Australia saying, actually, the financial stress is not good. And for them, the stress was not just financial. They also said that their stock were dying. So that is not good for animal welfare or human welfare, and part of that was COVID and not being able to get the lambs away. But the next point is, as picked up by Jeff and um, Ronaldo, is low carbon products. We actually have a pretty good record. You will have seen the latest research from Leggard and his team saying that we are lowest in dairy, we are lowest in um, beef and lamb, better even into Europe, than other countries can achieve, but other countries are catching up. And when we look at the list of companies, um, some of them were put up by Jeff, who want us to be part of their journey to their declared goals about reducing impact in terms of greenhouse gases, our best position is to be able to say we are fantastic and we're doing better all the time. And part of that is the research that's going on with pasture soil and animal management, which frankly we've been publishing in these proceedings since 1935 or possibly even earlier. The work that's being done on low methane sheep um, and cows and deer might be next, though putting deer into a perspex cage. Do you fancy that, Grant? No, oh, Jeff? No. Vaccines taking their time. Additives? Meh. Difficult to change a grass rumen rather than the TMRs, the total mix rations, that's easier. And so some of the products that we were investigating are not working as well here as expected. And then there's the technology eco pond. Of course, I'm a Ravenstein director, so you might say I might say that, but check the science behind it, there might be something. And then GE and John Caradus, ex-president here, is trying to lead a charge supported by some of us about trying to get the, re, um, the regulations reconsidered so that we can, and there's a paper on progress there later in the proceedings, trying to get some progress. And how are we going to get progress? We're going to look at what Damien O'Connor, our fearless leader up in Wellington, has actually just signed up to at the COAG, the, conference, uh, the Committee on Agriculture over in the OECD. And actually, he signed up to this and the fact that security and nutrition should not be off the agenda. We go back to the Paris Agreement for saying it's not about domestic food supply, which apparently is the current uh, America, the Wellington interpretation. It's about global. And when we look at this list, which I will share with anybody, the 13 points, the only one we don't do well on in terms of the rest of the world is this one, and that's because we've got nothing else. We have no very little industry, though noting that it's actually fossil fuel that is going up most. Why do we do so well on all of that? Because we've got permanent grassland. Because we are 
the rural professionals, the scientists and farmers working together, doing the nature conservation, doing the food production, and it's 40 million other people protein, Jeff. Let's think about essential amino acids, even dairy. Just alone, dairy feeds almost 1% of the world's essential amino acids for less than 0.04% of the greenhouse gases. Fantastic. Do the calculations for meat. We do sustainable food production. It's the well-being that we need to focus on to get through to Wellington. We certainly do the economy. We're good at the environment. Why? Because we have science, research, and application. And it's what we do. Thank you, wild man. Thank you, Jacqueline. Reliable as ever.